ensuring equity, ensuring that we all get to come with, ensuring that all the modes are accessible is a whole other animal. And, uh, and to delve into these issues for the next hour, I'm delighted to, uh, to welcome my NYU Rudin uh, Center for Transportation Policy and Management colleague, uh, she's the Associate Director, um, Sarah Kaufman, to come on stage and moderate our next session. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Greg. Um, I am glad to talk today about equity and cities. And so don't leave, it's a very important subject. Um, how many people here know the difference between equity and equality? Okay, so a pretty good number. Equality is giving the same thing to every single person. It's like one person, one vote, um, that is equality. Equity is giving different groups of people or different people, different resources, depending on what they need. And we're, we're gonna get more into what that means with the panel. So I'd like to call up the panel right now. And um, we can get into equity as a discussion in terms of things like uh, serving lower income neighborhoods or historically underserved areas and populations. Um, so thank you all for, for coming up on stage with me to discuss equity. Um, I'd like for each of you to kind of talk about your work in this area, and then we'll get into some deeper questions. So Devin, we'll start with you. Hi, so I'm Devin, uh, CEO and co-founder of Where Is My Transport, and uh, our work is largely focused on trying to bring attention to the large and relatively invisible and unmapped transit systems that are very pervasive uh, throughout the emerging markets and trying to improve the accessibility to these systems through uh, making the information more readily available to the populations that live in these places. Um, I'm Malcolm Kane. I'm the uh, director for the Office of Inclusion, which is a newly created office um, under the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission to uh, combat both service refusals and um, discrimination. Uh, this issue of illegal service refusals has been a historic I issue in the city of New York. Um, people of color, and particularly African Americans, had hard times, even to this day, uh, hailing yellow taxis in the city of New York. So through both education, outreach, prosecution, and other ways that um, we're dealing with this systemic issue, the office is actually seeing some impact and some um, positive outcomes with combating this issue. Uh, my name is Kirby Olson. Um, I work for the Oakland Department of Transportation. So we're a new department. We're kind of a startup. Uh, we're only in our second year. Um, and one of the pillars of our department is equity. And actually at the city of Oakland, we have a department of race and equity that's been incredibly um, instrumental in helping us as a department integrate equity into every single thing that we do. So how we do our paving, uh, where we put bike lanes, where we put shared mobility, bike share, car share, scooter share, uh, et cetera. So I manage shared mobility, um, so bike share, car share, scooter share. Um, and we have a lot of programs to make sure that we're actually serving the need in the community um, and make sure that services are provided equitably. My name is Elba Higueros. I'm the Chief Policy Officer at LA Metro. And while Metro is looking at various areas of equity, my um, role right now is to look into gender equity by overseeing Metro's um, Women and Girls Governing Council and the various initiatives um, that are coming out of that council in regards to gender equity. Great, thank you. Um, so I wanna jump back to the difference between equality and equity because Kirby, I think you have a great example of that. When we think of, of a bike share system, we provide a, a singular form of bike, usually, or maybe a couple different kinds, but they match kind of the average height and average capabilities of a person. But actually, an equitable bike share system provides different types of bikes for different types of use, use cases. So Kirby, can you talk a little bit about how Oakland is addressing that? Yeah, absolutely. So in Oakland, we have a docked bike share system. Um, and like you know, most bike share systems, there's only one type of bike. But we know that there's not just one type of body in Oakland, there's all kinds of bodies. Um, and that one type of bike is not gonna fit everybody, literally. So um, 
when we, when we were launching our bike share system, we got a complaint through our disability commission about the accessibility of the bike share system. They said, the system is not accessible. And they were right, it was not accessible. So uh, we started a process of working with our disability community and advocates to figure out some sort of pilot project or something that we could do to make bike share accessible and then learn from that and hopefully take those learnings and maybe integrate it at a larger scale within the system. So uh, what we settled on after a year and a half of sort of planning and arguing about what is accessible bike share, because it's still a fairly uh, nebulous concept. There's obviously a lot of different disabilities. There is a bike available for most disabilities, but actually deploying that uh, in a public system is very difficult. But what we have now is we have about seven different bikes, hand cycle, uh, adult trike, side-by-side -side tandem, et cetera. And we make them available two days a week um, near a protected bike lane in uh, Lake Merritt, which is in downtown, beautiful downtown Oakland. Um, and people can come and use the bikes for free. So it's primarily a recreational program. It's not really a point-to-point -point, uh, classic bike share model, but we have learned a lot from the program um, as far as sort of what the needs are, how much assistance people need, you know, transferring from a mobility device to a bike, for example, or you know, how many people need to leave their service animal somewhere. Um, so all these things are sort of data that we've collected, and now uh, we're preparing to make recommendations for how to uh, move forward with that program. Thanks, Kirby. That's a great example of how different users approach the system differently and how they can be served. But Malcolm, one thing that you're working really hard to address is people who are not served at all by the system. Can you talk about that a bit more? Yeah, uh, one thing with, this, with the office is what we're combating is um, the underreported incidents of illegal service refusals. Um, and what we have been seeing since the creation of the office in January is increased numbers, not only with uh, yellow taxis refusing people, but also with app uh, services, app drivers refusing passengers based on color or any other issues. Um, so what we've been doing now and with that is two things. One is outreach to the riding public to have them understand that your Uber driver, your Lyft driver is not supposed to call you once they're paired with you and ask you your destination and then refuse service to you. Um, and that you know it's not okay to just make the complaints through the app and get a credit or a refund for the trip. We are battling and we're trying to change driver behavior in the city of New York um, to make it more equ equitable city. Uh, but it's, it's really tough because you know, we're, we're, change, we're trying to combat something that's been a historic, historical issue in the city of New York and driver behavior will not change overnight. But I think we're seeing some impact because we're having honest dialogue with our drivers and we've never had these type of conversations with drivers um, and we're seeing results from that. That's great. And, and Elba, one aspect that you're looking at is ensuring the safety of passengers who travel throughout the city. Can you talk more about that? Um, yes. So uh, we have two directions we're taking. So we have our Women and Girls Governing Council that looks into Metro's current policies and programs and looks at how they can identify any challenges or barriers and um, make recommendations for solutions. So our Women and Girls Governing Council has um, been very proactive in terms of sexual harassment and sexual harassment prevention and looking at various campaigns in terms of like a bystander campaign as well as um, better reporting <coughs> for these incidents in order to be able to um, address them in a proactive way. Um, so um, the council is working very hard on, on those types of initiatives. And through our How Women Travel study, that was also an uh, initiative that came out of this council, we were able to really talk to our community, um, did some, um, some in-depth um, focus groups and community engagements to really understand the experience that women are encountering with safety and the perception of safety and how we can address those issues. And so um, we've received some really great insight into um, opportunities to address those through uh, better presence, better lighting, um, better design, um, utilizing crime prevention design, 
And so those are a lot of really great opportunities of just getting into the community and really asking them what do you need in order to make you feel safer on our system. And we find that generally our, our system is safe, but the perception of safety overcomes, you know, um, the actual experience. And so we want to make sure that all of our customers feel safe on our system. Yeah, and that's um, actually a shared issue that New York and LA and I think many other cities have where um, at NYU we looked into this as well and safety in public transit um, and the majority of women have experienced some form of harassment or assault while on public transportation and I think that that's not so different from what people are experiencing in cities around the country. Um, Devin, I'm wondering if you can point to the international experience a bit, talk about kind of what you're seeing in terms of informal transport and what are the differences um, between informal and formal transport and what the challenges are there. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, we've, we've been interviewing um, low-income community public transport users in cities across Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and I think our team has uh, done household surveys, focus groups, and ride-alongs uh, with uh, communities in about 10 major cities now. Um, safety is definitely sitting in the top two to three factors that are influencing uh, individuals' decisions. Um, but you know, to Elba's point, she was referring to uh, how the city of LA is looking at matters of how they can, within their infrastructure, improve aspects of safety for the commuter. However, a huge percentage of the public transportation that we're looking at sits well outside of the sort of state-owned infrastructure, and so that, that presents its own unique challenge. I mean, Mexico City has the Traveling Safely Initiative, uh, which looks to um, n address matters of violence against uh, women and girls uh, in transportation, actually uh, increase the level of sort of penalty and, and sort of enforcement that they apply to uh, when they uncover these incidents. Um, but that's still within, within the scope or the realm of the infrastructure, right? Uh, then we move into the informal sector within, let's say, East Africa, where you have the dollar dollar that's used throughout Tanzania. And uh, there is no sort of state initiative that's there to actually aid uh, women, and, women and children, women and girls in, in transportation. And so actually some of the initiatives we're seeing are coming out of grassroots and like uh, women at universities. Uh, there was a fantastic application that was covered by Reuters that was, uh, a, a, it's called Our Cries, if you want to look it up. And it's trying to enable women to have a voice in the informal transport system where they feel like there's nowhere to go. Um, the last initiative I think of that also refers to trying to address uh, this large um, population that sits outside of the realm of the typical infrastructure is a safety pin. That's an initiative that was kicked off in, in India. And that was trying to understand uh, and, and provide better statistics on safety and walkability of cities within, within India in particular. Yeah, it's a, re it's a really good point that these informal transit networks that often grow organically from communities that sit outside of the kind of typical coverage area of a government institution um, kind of escape the penalties of, of the regulatory system. Um, so, Malcolm, I think that you're trying to address that in New York City. Um, what, what is the process once once a discriminatory practice is recognized, what then happens to the driver or the um, fleet owner or the, the kind of for hire vehicle company that, that um, has enabled this discriminatory practice? Well, what happens is uh, first a complaint is made and uh, once we receive the complaint through the agency, um, we go through a very rigorous uh, investigation process to verify all the complaint details, um, contact the complaining witness, make sure that they are willing to testify either by phone or in person for the hearing. Um, and also just being transparent to the driver also about what their rights are and how they can defend themselves. Uh, if they are accused and get a summons uh, for a discriminatory practice or an illegal service refusal. Um, what usually happens, a bulk of the complaints, the drivers settle out. 
um, of, of, of court and they don't go to proceed to a hearing. But the third offense uh, within three years for our drivers leads to revocation, them lo losing their license. And you know, for those who know about New York City and our drivers, they do this full time and that's their livelihood. Um, so with that all being said, we are really doing a lot of outreach with drivers right now for them to be educated on why this is an issue and they're putting their livelihood on the line when they are refusing a passenger or they are saying a slur to a passenger, anything like that. Uh, we have to be transparent on that side because we want our drivers to be on the road at the end of the day. That's a, that's a really good point. And when, um, what's really interesting is that uh, when we talk about these safety concerns and when we talk about the discriminatory practices, what we're talking about is um, people losing their access to transportation because they don't feel safe or they're not safe or they're not being served. And often what comes of it is that they end up driving their personal vehicles. Um, and so a lot of what we've talked about throughout this conference and what many of us talk about regularly is the reduction of personal vehicle use. But if someone doesn't feel safe or they don't get service when they are trying to get it, they will resort to whatever they can do best, wherever they feel safe, whatever service they can use late at night and not feel like something terrible is going to happen. Um, so Elba, I want to turn it over to you. We've talked about a lot in these last two days about reducing personal car usage in Los Angeles. And you're working to make uh, LADOT, the streets, and the metro safer. But um, how do we reconcile getting people to feel safe and, while also reducing their personal car usage if that's the only place where they actually do feel safe? Um, well, I think when we look at metro's riders, this, the, the area of concern is that a lot of our riders do not have access to a car. And so when there are issues of um, you know, perception of safety, the concern that we have is that they may not be taking the trips that they need to take. They may have to take alternative modes, whether it be walking or waiting for a family member to give them a ride. Um, so those are the issues that we're more concerned about because of the limitation of access to a vehicle and sometimes uh, the limitation of affordability. So you may not be able to um, afford a car or afford uh, you know, a ride hailing service. So our concern is really to make sure that the burden of uh, the travel burden on women and girls is not um, weighed heavily on them in terms of their transportation modes. We want to ensure that they're able to get to where they need to get, um, to school, to work, and take care of the responsibilities that they need to, utilizing our transit system. Yeah, and, and financially, it is a concern, especially internationally, when we look at women and girls and their access to finances. Um, Devin, a question that I have for you is how um, informal transport networks accommodate populations that may be cash-based but hailing these rides digitally. Um, how does it? How is it working um, in in different communities um, as our society goes increasingly cashless? But informal transport networks tend to rely on cash. It's not working. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, within within these communities, I think we've we've been running a few studies that are isolated, and we we tend not to actually do much press about these sort of things. But something that we've we've seen could have a, a, a great impact is when you are break down uh, the types of trips that are being made. Firstly, uh, women, broadly speaking, um, are inordinately exposed compared to men, not just because of the gender separation, but because women tend to engage in multi-purpose trips because they're the caregivers for their family units or, or, or broader than that. So they tend to have higher degrees of exposure over the course of the day. Um, but also when you look at the, the, the sort of types of trips that occur, you've got your short leg trips that are sort of the feeder trips um, that happen in and out of, of uh, sort of communities, living areas, and then you've got the longer connection trips that, that occur. I believe that you can, 
that there's a lot that can be done within the shorter trips that are happening within those communities um, by actually improving sort of an understanding of timing on transportation. So what you need to bear in mind is, uh, and I, I touched on this point yesterday, and it was I know, surprising to a, a number of people in the audience, but the average trip for a commuter within these markets starts at five hours per day. Two and a half hours in, two and a half hours out. That's, where, that's our baseline, right? We go up from there. So that's an incredibly long time to be exposed, if I can, if I can call it that. And there's a significant portion that sits at the, at the sort of start and end of these trips for the short legs. And so if we're able to start to introduce some form of timing, people are able to reduce their exposure. Um, when we were doing the ride-alongs, uh, our team would have to rock up at some of these locations at 4.30 in the morning, because that's when the family unit wakes up, right? And the first individuals are leaving the home at 5.15 in order to get to their place of work so that they can be there at a respectable time. Um, that's insane for, you know, all of us are in this room are sufficiently privileged to know that that's, that's not something we get exposed to, but um, it's not something we would put up with, yet this is a reality for individuals, and you know, we speak about people choosing to use their own car. People in these marks don't have, that's not a choice they get to make. They're necessitized to use this form of transportation. So things that can be done, and this is where I feel like technology is role to play, that can reduce that period of exposure, um, that can have a really, really great impact. Um, because at the end of the day, waiting for the state to deploy different kinds of infrastructure, um, it's simply just, it's not gonna happen anytime soon, unfortunately. Yeah, that's, that's really well said, thank you. Um, Kirby, I want to return to Oakland and specifically East Oakland. Um, what I really like as a kind of great example of cultural sensitivity that um, your office has done is um, establishing bike lanes in East Oakland. Can you talk a little bit about that project? Yeah, so um, we finished our bike plan, I think about six months ago. And the bike plan was, I think, a fantastic example of actually partnering with the community. Um, rather than just listening, the community was actually empowered to help write, a, help write the plan. So we partnered with, I think, four to six community groups uh, that actually led the outreach events, the workshops, the design workshops, um, et cetera. And every, at every step of the plan, the, the community was empowered to basically help make the decisions about the plan. Um, so that really paid dividends for us, um, especially for one bike lane project in East Oakland on 98th Ave. So we have a fantastic community group in Oakland called the Scraper Bike Team. So if you haven't heard of them, I recommend looking them up. They have some great videos on YouTube. Um, and they basically trick out bikes in really bright colors. They put sound systems on there. Um, and they ride around uh, Oakland. And it's incredibly fun, uh, amazing, family-friendly uh, events. Um, so when we wanted to do a bike lane on 98th Ave, we're obviously engaging the Scraper Bike Team. That's sort of their base of operations. And they said, well, we don't, we don't want bike lanes that are on the side of the street with just paint. Like, that's not going to work for us. We don't ride on the side of the street. We ride in the middle of the street. So, um, you know, Hearing that, as a traditional transportation engineering hat would say, uh, that's unsafe, that's ridiculous, we're not going to do that, we're going to put in a regular bike lane. But we have a sort of different uh, paradigm um, in Oakland with our bike plan, and so we figured it out. We put the bike lane in the middle of the street. It's called the Scraper Bikeway. Um, you can check it out. Um, and basically, the, the middle lane has been converted from a center turn to a bike lane with a uh, bollard protected and with, a, with murals um, in the middle of the street. Um, murals that were designed by the Scraper Bike Team and that celebrate sort of their unique style of, of bikes. So um, yeah, it's, a, it's an example of not, not just sort of um, subjecting the community to a bike lane, but asking them how they would like to see a bike lane installed in their community. I love that example of community engagement. Um, Elba, have you done similar community engagement prog projects at LADOT in order to, uh, to cater to the needs of specific communities? Um, we've done several community engagements. Um, I will say in regards to um, our women and girls, um, our uh, 
our study has a lot of community engagement. We really um, targeted hard to reach populations. Um, we reached out to women experiencing homelessness, women, immigrant women, um, women with disabilities, the, the women that are our most vulnerable population that we really needed to get their input and their feedback. And so um, I think we will continue, obviously, to do those types of um, in-depth engagement and, and really having those honest conversations in order to, to make the improvements that we need to make and develop, you know, create a system that, that meets their needs. Yeah, that's really well put. Reaching out to the most vulnerable populations in order to improve their mobility improves the mobility of the entire population. Um, one thing that we've talked about a lot at LA Commotion is uh, the topic of subsidies. So um, one thing that cities like Chicago are doing are kind of um, encouraging uh, micromobility and, and shared mobility companies to, uh, to locate their vehicles in lower income neighborhoods um, in order to encourage use of these modes and encourage these companies to provide these modes for lower income communities. Um, when we talk about subsidies, I wonder to what extent um, each of you believes that these different modes should be subsidized in order to serve lower income populations, um, even though many shared mobility companies would lose their profitability or even more um, by locating in areas that may be deemed unprofitable. Um, Kirby, since, since we discussed this earlier, would you like to jump in first? Sure. Um, yeah, it does seem to be a theme of the conference, uh, scooter companies saying, hey, we need some subsidies too. Um, and it's sort of reasonable, right? The automobile industry has had massive subsidies. Every public transit system in America gets massive subsidies. If we believe that micromobility is an important part of our transportation ecosystem and that it's helping us achieve our goals of greenhouse gas reduction, uh, getting people out of single occupancy vehicles, then why not? Why don't they get a share of the subsidy? I think there's a reasonable argument to be made there. I'm willing to have that conversation. Um, but you know, where is this subsidy going to come from? Like our DOT doesn't, we don't have like a lot of extra money lying around, right? But um, I think it has to come from the sort of larger scale funding agencies. We have like county funding agencies, regional ones, Caltrans, et cetera. As has been mentioned many times on this stage, they're spent, spending ridiculous amounts of money on freeway widening here. Um, in a lot of other cities, if we could divert even a tiny percentage of what it costs to widen the 405 freeway to shared mobility, then everyone could basically have all of their scooter trips subsidized uh, in most of Los Angeles, right? So um, I think it's reasonable if it's, if it's actually sort of inducing them to provide service in places that they wouldn't otherwise. I'm, I'm open to that conversation, but I don't know where, honestly, I'm going to get the money to do that. Um, and Malcolm. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting, this is an interesting question because um, we've been doing over 30 different focus groups with our drivers about why they refuse passengers. Um, and one thing they bring up is economic concerns about uh, deadhead fees, especially for yellow taxi drivers not getting uh, trips back into the city, back into Manhattan, if they go to the outer boroughs like Brooklyn and the Bronx. Um, and, you know, I understand it because, you know, that, that is a reality. A lot of the yellow taxi drivers do not get trips to come back into the city at times. Um, and it's very competitive. So we, you know, are in early conversations to look at the feasibility of incentivizing drivers to, especially yellow taxi drivers, to go out um, to some of these low-income neighborhoods and outer boroughs to get trips. And I think um, that... if. You know, if it's played out correctly, we will see decreased numbers in some of the destination refusals that we receive. Do you want to take this? Or <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I often find myself speaking to the ride-hailing drivers in, in different parts of the world and um, sort of just asking them about the experience of, of providing these services. and. When it comes to low-income communities, what I found it to be a trend, um, and this is in at least the conversation I've had with several cities across Africa and Latin America at this point, um, 
when the trips are cash-based, the drivers will often refuse um, because there's a very high prevalence of hijacking that actually occurs, particularly after dark. And so um, I, I wouldn't err towards the side of encouraging ride-hailing um, to, to try and access these, these areas. But to the point of subsidy, that's why I feel it's a bit of a slippery slope there. But um, uh, on the point of subsidization, informal transportation is largely, actually, is completely unsubsidized. Uh, however, I do feel like if there were a way for them to feasibly introduce subsidies into informal transportation, um, and there's a massive challenge of fragmentation, so it's like it's not like you're trying to subsidize one or two operators, you're trying to subsidize 10,000 independent operators, which is its own kind of um, uh, difficulty. But if they are able to do that, they can start to change the economic model by which these tr independent transport operators are operating, which thereby would also have a positive impact on the safety component. Um, very simply, you know, a driver pays up front for their vehicle, and they know that if they don't make 12 full trips in a day, they're running at a loss, as in they've already taken the risk right up front by getting the vehicle for the day. And so they're having to hoof it back and forth to make sure they make the requisite number of trips. But if there was able to be some kind of subsidy covering for a certain baseline, the drivers, that incentive wouldn't exist for the drivers to drive like, you know, like a crazy person. And so the, the net effect is that the actual experience of that mode of transportation would be much safer. And given that 90% of the population uses it, uh, I would say that's a pretty widespread effect. That's, yeah. that's really well put. Alba, do you want to jump in, or would you like to pass? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm wondering if uh, we've been talking about equity in terms of safety, in terms of access, um, accessibility, and, um, and forms of payment. I'm wondering if each of you could bring up an example of a place that is doing transportation well, very well, in terms of equity. What are, in, in one of those areas, what are some, what's a program or a transportation system that you hold up as a model of equity? I'm putting you on the spot right now, so whoever wants to jump I'll, in. I'll kick off. Um, I'll actually expand on the, the Mexico City example. Um, so Mexico City have done um, a number of things. They've introduced uh, kiosks, so this is touching on infrastructure now. They've introduced kiosks where people can uh, report incidents and actually um, feel like something is being done about it. There is the sort of education component. So uh, on many of the longer trips, both on bus and train, they actually sort of there are people that will come on board and they'll educate um, people on board the train about what they can do should they see something or should they be a victim of 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 um, an incident. And actually, um, they've also created uh, woman-only uh, carriages. Um, I think on currently on the metro system, it's about 60%, 58% of all the lines have women-only carriages. And on the BRT system, 100% uh, of the lines have uh, supported women-only transportation. And uh, then there's also the same exists within the ride-hailing uh, ride space within the city. So they've, they've taken on a number of initiatives to try and, try and improve that there. That's a, that's a really interesting point, and I think um you know, we can get more into this, um, but the but the women only transport carriages or subway cars, which are popular in about 12 cities around the world, um, are a highly divisive issue because although they provide safety along the route, they don't get to the root of the problem. Yeah. Um, and which is just people behaving badly. Um, and so it's an interesting question of whether whether that's a worthwhile project. Um, or if there are other approaches that can be taken. And I think, um, Elba, you're, you're taking it on the other way, but I think internationally we're seeing a lot of women-only travel modes. Uh, no, I, I agree, I agree with, with your thought in regards to for a um, few minutes we looked into that, our, our council did look into that, but exactly what you said, that it doesn't really address the issue. For right, for that moment, it's addressed. But as soon as you get off that bus, you're still 
unfortunately dealing with those kinds of experiences, whether it be at the bus stop, at the bus, you know, at the, the train platform. Um, and so, uh, so I think there's a bigger, um, a bigger issue at hand and to address um, sexual harassment and experiences. Um, but I, but I appreciate the, the situation being very different abroad than it is here in the U.S. And so there may be kind of more urgent measures to be taken in some of these places. Um, and I want to get to the three of you as well. Um, what are some transportation systems that you're holding up as especially equitable, especially doing a really wonderful job or examples of projects or programs? Well, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily point to one in particular, but I think with uh, this new office, what we've been doing is trying to create a model for ourselves in New York by bringing new stakeholders to the table. Um, never before where we have civil rights advocates, disability rights advocates, and driver advocates all at the table talking about how can we bring equitable transportation to the city of New York. Um, and one way that we are doing is calling the issues for what it is. We're dealing with um, systemic racism, systemic oppression and discrimination in the city with a lot of different policies. Um, but I think having that conversation with everyone that's involved is really important uh, to create that model and to create that change. So I, I couldn't point to one transportation you know, network as an example, but I think we're creating that change, we're creating that model, um, and, and I, like I said, we're seeing the impact on the city right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to represent Oakland again. So um, <laughs> in Oakland, uh, we have the highest percentage of riders enrolled in our low-income discount program of any bike share system in the country, as far as I know, 20%. Um, and it took a lot of work to get there. Uh, so I don't know if any of you all have used dock-based traditional bike share programs, but they can be really complicated and hard to use. Uh, I remember the first time I used one, uh, I was in New York City, I rode up to Central Park, realized there's no bike share docks up there. After having spent like 20 minutes figuring out how to unlock it for the first time, I was then, you know, biking around upper Manhattan, totally lost, and I got a huge fine that was assessed six months later. So anyway, not an intuitive user experience to say the least. Um, so when we were launching bike share in the Bay Area, uh, we really thought about how to actually um, introduce it to the community in a way that was sort of authentic and made sense, because I think it's a system that's complex enough that you really almost need somebody to explain it to you. You need like a friend to tell you how it works, and that's how I ultimately figured out how it worked. Um, but so we have this program called Bike Share for All, and we partnered with a number of Basically, we had an equity nonprofit that led the program, and then they hired actual community-based organizations to go out in the community, literally with an iPad, and sign people up for the low-income program and show them how to use the system. So it was like your friend explaining how to use bike share, uh, but they're also offering you a discount if you're low-income. So um, that program paid dividends, uh, because we have 20% of our members are actually uh, low-income members, and though that low-income membership is far more diverse than our regular bike share membership. So our typical full-price user is a white male making over 100K with a master's degree, um, whereas the uh, low-income membership basically represents the community. And Oakland is the most diverse city in America. So um, our system actually represents the community because of all that work that we put in up front. And I will say that I think LA Metro is doing some outstanding things in terms of equity. Um, we developed an equity framework um, that is going to be used on how we fund, design, build um, our infrastructure over the next couple of years. Um, Metro is um, participated in a GAIR program, which is a government alliance for racial equity, and um, developed a race equity action plan. Um, also, uh, having uh, our women and girls program in regards to the various issues um, for gender equity, as well as, you know, um, uh, our workforce has increased in terms of women, and we recognize that in order to really have that gender perspective, we need to have women at the table that are making these decisions on how we fund, design, and plan our system. So we're really proud that we've been increasing 
um, the number of women in our workforce and in leadership roles. Um, but I also say that, um, that uh, Transport of London has done some amazing things in regards to, to gender, developing a gender action plan. And so we really look um, to them and, and for um, guidance and inspiration on how we um, develop our, our gender equity program. I actually just want to put you on the spot. So I know you were, you were supposed <laughs> to be on the panel here with us, and yes. um, you're incredibly informed on this topic. So it would be great maybe to hear your response to that question. Um, thanks. <laughs> 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 um, uh, I did not have an answer prepared. Um, there are a lot neither, of neither aspects <laughs> of, of equity uh, that, we, um, that we really haven't even covered because it's such a broad subject and we actually haven't talked about accessibility for people with physical and cognitive disabilities. Um, and I don't think that any location is particularly stellar in that area, but, um, but I do think that a lot has to be done. Um, and I do actually, this isn't an example of, of this isn't a good example, but it's, an, it's a kind of heads up to people developing these modes for the future, developing autonomous modes or a suitcase that follows you around or a delivery robot. Um, this was discussed actually in the freight panel earlier and it's, it's come up a lot lately that a lot of these little things that are gonna rove around our sidewalks and deliver pizza and Amazon packages and other things don't know how to handle accessibility issues. Um, there was a news item last week that one delivery robot was blocking a curb cut for about 20 minutes and people in wheelchairs couldn't get across the street because this delivery robot didn't know how to navigate around people. So I think um, as we look forward to our new modes and our accessible and our uh, autonomous shuttles and all the different services that we're going to provide, and many of them are examples here, we need to keep all of the users in mind, um, including people who are in wheelchairs, people who with low vision, people who don't speak the language natively and so can't unlock that shared mode, um, and people who may, for whatever reason, not be able to use that service. We need to have all of the stakeholders at the table, as Elba's doing in, here in LA. Um, so that's just kind of a, a message that I want to get across to people developing these modes going forward. Um, I do want to take a moment to uh, open it up to audience Q&A, if anyone here has a question. Um, so I, I guess the assumption that I have in my mind is that people who are living in, in a, a lower income area will have to travel further to get to their jobs. So how does that play into your decision to invest in something like a bike share program versus more buses in the fleet? Uh, and, and kind of what is that calculus? Is that a piece of what you think about whenever you're making these decisions, length of the commute? Um, I'll go ahead and jump in and say that length of commute is a huge consideration um, in terms of uh, economic opportunity factors. Um, the number of people, the number of jobs that a person has access to within an hour of their commute is a key indicator of their success, um, their economic success, because they are, they are more likely to increase their income by having access to more jobs, by being able to move around job to job. So um, the shorter the commute to a job center, the, um, the better their economic opportunity levels. Um, but in terms of specific modes, uh, I'm gonna turn that over to the panel. Yeah, so I don't know if this will answer your question, but I have a few sort of findings that we've seen with uh, shared mobility in Oakland. So one, for our bike share for all, the low income discount, one of the areas that has the most members or one of the zip codes that has the most members for that program is actually in Richmond, a city that's like four cities to the north of Oakland. Um, and so I think it speaks to that 
you know, a lot of the people that are in working in Oakland are actually coming from Richmond, and maybe they're using bike share as the last mile once they get to Oakland to get to their destination. Um, another thing that we've seen is that among the bike share stations in our lower income communities, there is not the same pattern of people using bike share to get to mass transit. So everywhere else in Oakland, the map of bike share trips looks like a hub and spoke system where almost all the trips are from outlying stations to a transit hub. And then basically people take BART into downtown San Francisco to work in their corporate office job or whatever. In the low income communities, that's not how people are getting around. It's more they're taking a trip directly from their neighborhood to somewhere else like that's within the city but kind of far away. Um, and I think it also, I think that, that sort of more distributed trip pattern is why traditional dock-based bike share hasn't been super well adopted in our low-income communities, whereas scooter share, by contrast, has. So with a scooter, you're obviously free to go wherever you want. And it, I, my hypothesis is that sort of the, the job distribution for low-income employees and workers is not all in a downtown corporate office. It's like spread out among retail, manufacturing, service, all kinds of different uh, industries that tend to have more low-wage workers. Um, so they've found scooters to be very useful because they can go directly from you know, their door to the door of the retail shop or wherever they happen to work. Um, when we studied uh, the How Women Travel, um, women tend to make shorter trips. We found that um, the high majority took less than five miles and the majority was under 10 miles. So that information um, based on, together with uh, Metro's doing a next gen study where they're looking at our whole bus system and looking at how to make it more efficient and address the needs of our, of our customers. So I think it's really just based about um, looking at the, the data, looking, talking to the communities and really understand where are they going and what kind of trips do they need. But um, from the How Women Travel study, we know that women are taking more of the shorter trips, and that's sometimes due to the household responsibilities, staying close to children, um, or working part-time. And so, um, so yeah, we, we are taking that into consideration in terms of how we plan and operate our system. Thank you. That's handy, trip linking for the microphone. Uh, Elba, uh, with the survey results that you have where, where women express strong concerns about security, and, and we've done similar studies. We've sat in a focus group in Philadelphia where middle-aged women were basically saying, we want more police on the subway. How do you then respond to the groups in some cities that are actually advocating for fewer police on transit? So what we've heard from women is they want more presence. So it doesn't necessarily mean you need police officers. It means we, they, they want the presence of um, someone of authority. So we're exploring opportunities of, of using a, another way of having that presence. Um, some of the best practices from other agencies is to have transit ambassadors. Um, and on our system so that, you know, if an issue arises, that person can help them and know what to do. So, so yes, um, in our survey, they said they wanted two thirds, I believe, wanted more security. But when we really, through our focus groups and our community engagement, um, it was not just security, it was about having that presence. And also, you know, in a survey, it's how you ask the question, right? If I don't give you another option, you pick the option that's available to you. So it's really important to have that qualitative information combined with the quantitative information to, to really see what our next steps are. So uh, just building off of that, so much of this uh, tackling of equity issues is rooted in feedback and community outreach. And I think one thing we're seeing with certain like BRT projects in LA is that a lot of that feedback is, um, some of it can be louder than others, and some of it, whether it's rooted in nimbyism or whether it's rooted in valid concerns, not that those aren't valid, um, it can just kind of confuse the message. And I'm just curious, I mean, I thought, uh, Malcolm, you brought up a great point about 
trying to find out why the riders were not going out to the outer boroughs. So um, it's kind of a two question. One, how do you get that level of honesty from the people you're dealing with with really uncomfortable topics? And the other is more for uh, LA DOT and Metro, uh, sorry, Oakland DOT and Metro. How are you guys refining and optimizing uh, the feedback you're receiving in these really high pressure debatable issues? Well, uh, for us, with the focus groups, that has been our main focal point to gather information from our drivers on why they are refusing. Um, and and uh, full disclosure, before I, you know, did the focus groups, I said drivers were going to hold back, they weren't going to be honest, but I, I was surprised. We got explicit language from drivers about different groups of people and why they don't pick them up, um, and, and valid concerns that they have, whether it be about safety concerns in certain neighborhoods, economic concerns. Um, and we collect that through uh, our team members who are, are present at these groups. Um, we take down their, their notes and we go to where they're at too. That's another place, another thing that we do. We go to their safe spaces, whether it be their mosques, their churches, their driver centers. Because if we want honest feedback, if we want valid feedback, we don't bring them to us. We got to go to them and talk to them where they feel safe and comfortable. So um, that's how we got over that challenge. And, and fortunately for us, it hasn't been, uh, it has been really productive and fruitful for us to, for us to get valid information that we can use to help with policy changes. Yeah, I think so. Uh, when we're talking about equity, it's about providing more resources and power to groups that have less resources and power, right? And so um, I, in Oakland, I imagine LA too, there are a lot of groups that already are very empowered, right? They already have an incredible amount of influence in local government and in decision making. You know, they have their council person's cell phone number. They know the mayor. They have a lot of money. They can make political donations. They have a lawyer. So these are groups that do not need any more empowerment, right? And then what we're trying to do is to empower the groups that are underheard, whose voices are not typically uh, heard in the decision making process. So that means in community outreach, yes, we're going to get a lot of complaints from the NIMBYs, et cetera. We need to be, what, what we've talked about internally is when we collect feedback in, in community outreach events to note who we're receiving it from, right? So if all of the no votes or the people opposing the BRT project are, are wealthy and white, like, okay, that's an empowered community. And the people who are saying yes to the BRT who are gonna enjoy the benefits are non-white and lower income, that needs to be taken into account. I think if we're going to do equitable outreach, we have to empower those underheard voices more than the voices are, are already empowered and already typically control the process. And I'll just add that it's important for us to work with our community-based organizations throughout LA County. Um, I recognize that not everyone can attend a community event or you know, a workshop. People are working. Um, people have other responsibilities, and those are the people that probably have decisions will impact them the most, but don't necessarily have that voice to participate in some of these um, outreach events. So working together really closely with community-based organizations, I think, is very important, as well as being very intentional of getting really into the community and finding out and hearing those voices and making sure that, that they're accounted for. Thank you. Do we have another question? Hi, uh, I was thinking about the statement you made earlier about um, you, know, you, you, you support the most vulnerable um, and you get, sort of, you get a better transportation system for all. But in a, in a scenario where we you know, have finite resources and increasingly constrained resources, I feel like there's a lot of tension between how to provide service, especially in shared modes, for the majority versus making sure you give access and empower these marginalized communities. Um, so I, I guess I'm wondering, how, what are some of the approaches, the process, what is the communication or the conversations that need to happen to come to that balance to try to figure out how to allocate these resources between the majority versus some of these, these uh, more communities of concern? It's a great question. Well, I'll, I'll just say quickly, when you look at the riders 
our metro riders, our customers, they are the minority. You know, they're, I think 60% are below the poverty rate. You know, um, so, so they are our majority customers and, um, and we are focusing on making sure that the system addresses their needs. Um, when, uh, through our study and uh, focusing on, on women, 60% are below the poverty rate and 90% of them use the system um, three days and more. I mean, th those are our customers and so we need to focus um, and put a really uh, um, intentional approach to improving the system to meet um, their needs. And I think there was, so, sorry, so I was thinking of an example of where this challenge, I've seen this come up in conversations, is say, for example, a bus, uh, a transit provider in an urban core wants to improve the, the, the trip times mm -hmm. for like a bus line. And so they're, they propose taking out stops, but then you have these communities who it's more of a challenge than to go a block or two extra is, is more of a challenge for them, especially people with disabilities. Um, and so that's that's an example of where I've seen this type of yeah. I, this type of tension. Yeah, and I'll say um, our next gen study um, is looking at how to make our system more efficient. And I think the what's important is when you take something, you need to be able to mitigate it and provide something else. Whether if you take a stop, it's because you know we're improving the the bus time, so that's that's what you're getting in return. You know, if we take this bus stop, we, there's three back to back, right? And you take one, it's because now we're going to improve it by a minute, your whole trip. So just explaining and letting people know what the benefit is to them. We're not just taking something just to take it. It really is. We're trying to make the system more efficient and improve it for, for them. And so I think it's just about communicating and, and, and um, articulating really well what the benefit is to them in the long run. So, so And another way I would, and I agree with what you've said, and the, another way I would answer that is that, um, as, as Devin has explained, there are so many informal transit networks. Um, when we talk about lower income communities, a lot of these communities are making do in ways that are completely outside of the formal transit networks that the city is providing. Um, in New York City, we have things called dollar vans, which are basically jitneys um, that run back and forth and they're totally wild and um, mostly unregulated. But, and they're very much based in certain ethnic communities. Um, and actually, there are about 100,000 people who ride them every day. And reaching out to these existing informal transit networks is a really good way for a kind of cash-strapped city or, or other uh, transportation agency to enhance what's already there by providing safety measures. And instead of rebuilding an entire um, bus network to those areas, actually enhancing what they have already through safety, accessibility, and um, formality of payment. I think we have time for one last question. But a, a quick one. It's gonna be very, gonna be very <laughs> quick, because i just like to say, hearing this, you think things are gloomy, but I just wanna give a perspective as somebody who grew up in Philadelphia taking transit to school, and if somebody had said to me there would be buses that people on wheelchairs could get on, I would have said, we all would have said, you're crazy. And then the federal government passed, passed the ADA, and now when I take a bus in Santa Monica, there's a person with a wheelchair can get on the bus. So progress has been made and can be made. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Amen. Yes, that's a, a great point to end on. Progress has been made, can be made, and we are all here to ensure that it continues to be made for the entirety of the population. So thank you.